What's so provocative about rapamycin for anti-aging is that it has increased the longevity or lifespan of every species that it's been tested on. So a quick recap of rapamycin. Uh, it is a natural compound from Streptomyces hygroscopicus found initially off of Easter Island. It is an inhibitor of mTOR, that's mammalian target of rapamycin, that is um, part of the pathways for cell cycles. If that gets dysfunctional, um, you can have well, disease states popping up in things like diminishing bone mineral density leading to osteoporosis, uh, limited pulmonary function leading to like COPD, um, there is cardiac hypertrophy, there is potential cancer, uh, atherosclerosis, uh, and some cardi cardiovascular disease states as well. And traditional medicine is routinely using rapamycin on a daily basis in what you would deem as like high-risk patient populations, uh, high risk for possible more disease states or high risk for otherwise health disparities, which can imply to some degree potentially um, a limited side effect profile or an otherwise mundane side effect profile. Um, some of the side effects that we have found from rapamycin are... Um, really from mTOR inhibitions. So this could be low platelet count. Uh, this can be also low insulin production. We'll touch on that actually a little bit down the road too. There are some more severe side effects, uh, including like possible like edema. Uh, we have even pulmonary toxicity and bone marrow toxicity, but everything should be taken in context. Uh, there's going to be a trial that we talk on a little bit um, that talked about mucositis really being one of the main ones for um, the dosing that's going to be used for anti-aging. But just kind of want to give you a bigger picture of uh, a total uh, more encompassing side effect profile, and that is non-exhaustive. But the main things that you might run across if you're going to be using rapamycin for anti-aging would be the mucositis, um, but then also low platelet count, and then possibly uh, low insulin production. And the, the curious thing about that low, low platelet count, right, um, that's actually something that low-dose aspirin is aiming for to um, help with heart health. So side effect, yes, but possibly a, a benefit for anti-aging in and in of itself down the road. Based on the species that it's been tested against, it has prolonged the life of every species. It's been tested from yeast to worms, fleas, uh, mice, and the life extension is still coming out as to what degree it's helping with humans. I think there's gonna be even a trial out this year um, with rapamycin in the anti-aging context. Um, we do know also how it works within the body, inhibiting mTOR, and we know that dysfunctional mTOR can cause hyperfunctioning cell morphology, so cells um, being overactive can lead to certain things. I touched this on the other video, but like your osteoclasts in your bones, if those were hyperfunctioning, you're gonna deteriorate your bones faster than you're building it which could potentially lead to that osteoporosis, right? So if we can inhibit mTOR, Bingo! we're less likely to develop disease states down the road, okay? So that's the logic kind of to follow there. Systematic reviews can encompass a large amount of data and distill out any like correlations. Um, so it gives us a better uh, take on what might be true and what might not be true. You still have to use your clinical discernment or um, decision making to figure out if, if you find this to be the case, but it can it, it provide more weight towards uh, correlates there. So they used 11,717 articles using their own um, rigorous standards set um, by the researching body. Only 19 of these studies were deemed eligible uh, for examination uh, based on age-related diseases and rapamycin use. This included uh, 2,077 individuals, both men and women. The median age was 25 to 81 years old. Uh, and the cohort sizes, so sizes of like the arms, like you have a placebo, you have um, a variable, so one that's getting rapamycin, one that's not. Uh, those who considered arms, the arms were from sizes six people, six people <laughs> to 1,021. The majority of studies were randomized controlled trials, which is pretty neat. I mean, we take into account all trials, but RCTs are called, are considered a gold standard, especially for traditional medicine. A lot of blockbuster drugs, blockbuster drugs being drugs that are 
doing good, limited side effect profile, a lot of people on them, and uh, they're, hel they're helpful. Not all blockbuster drugs are that way, but usually it takes an RCT or a randomized controlled trial and the benefits from that for it to get onto the market. Um, so, And they were taken from uh, multiple different company, uh, countries, USA, New Zealand, Germany, Austria, Australia, sorry. Uh, China is one of them too. Um, it's a wonderful addition for the push of rapamycin to be used as an anti-aging or um, aging longevity piece to your life. So uh, it's nice to have this information coming out. So we're going to address some of the things that were in it in a non-exhaustive way. So there's more information in that systematic review. Feel free um, to dig in there and check it out for yourself, but we'll cover some of the things they went over. So one of the things that was found from the systematic review, again, that is a review of a bunch of other different articles and trials that were done with rapamycin for different indications or for, for different dosing, um, but they distilled it down to what was uh, anti-aging related, okay, uh, and then the, the dosing that was involved or any benefits, pros and cons. Uh, I, I like to touch on this one. I touched on it in a methylene blue video, like topical, right? So can you use this for skin rejuvenation or that kind of the vanity side of things? Surprisingly, or I thought it was surprising, but maybe it's not surprising. Rapamycin at 0 0.5 uh, milliliters applied topically. I think it was oh, 24 to 48 hours. It was for eight months, had a significant reduction in the senescence. Um, senescence means like cell kind of death or cell... Uh, deterioration, so it had uh, marked results on um, reduction of skin senesc senescence via biomarkers. So they use a biomarker to quantitatively an analyze that. So it wasn't just subjective. They could uh, look at, you know, like one plus one equals two quantitative. They used biomarkers that showed the senescence was reduced, but then also from a histological uh, vantage point, they showed. Um, it looks like uh, appearance of skin tissue was better as well. So histological would be to some degree that visual interpretation. So subjectively, the skin looked better, um, but that was also validated by biomarkers that they used to see the senescence of the cell, the deterioration deterioration of the cell had been reduced as well. Um, 0 0.75 uh, milligrams, so three quarters of a milligram orally every 12 hours for two days of something called Everolimus. Everolimus is related to rapamycin. Uh, it is a second generation of rapamycin. It has a shorter half-life, so this was something they were also trialing or studying and still might be too. Um, followed by a serum level maintenance of 5 to 8 nanograms per milliliter over six months had significant enhancements in cardiac output. Um, this led to reductions of pulmonary vascular resistance um, and pulmonary arterial pressure. Um, other things trending positively like oxygen consumption um, and also cardiac workload decreased. And then again with biomarkers, there's a biomarker NT Pro BNP. They use that for management of heart failure, uh, coronary artery, artery disease and acute coronary syndrome. Um, that biomarker had also uh, shown that those were decreased or that biomarker decreased, showing that that was less likely. Um, again, this is all from that systematic review here. There was, and I said one of the side effect profiles uh, was insulin, um, well, it would be hyperglycemia, right? And so there was a study on dosing that showed that it did not impact glucose. Uh, rapamycin, one milligram per day for eight weeks, did not have an effect on fasting, random glucose, nor on insulin sensitivity. Also no effect on plasma lipids. So hyperlipidemia or um, like high cholesterol was one of the things that um, is a side effect potentially of rapamycin. So compared to placebo, also 12 milligrams orally, two hours before exercise, had no effect on blood insulin levels and no effect on cortisol concentration, uh, which is great. Another study with daily dose um, pointed towards um, potential dyslipidemia. Dis uh, dyslipidemia. So I just gave you some about how it didn't affect it. We have a little confliction here. There is a study saying that there was some dyslipidemia, everolimus. Again, this was the second generation. Uh, that first one was with rapamycin though. Everolimus though at six milligrams orally uh, for 12, week, 12 weeks in patients with rheumatoid arthritis did show a modest increase in total cholesterol, triglycerides, and LDL. Um, but after completion, it returned to baseline. So uh, a bunch of these side effects are, are reversible. 
There was a study done on mice, and at two weeks, they were showing signs of dyslipidemia and uh, insulin um, insulin resistance, really. Uh, and then at 20 weeks, it had all reversed, and, and they were showing some of the beneficial aspects, so it almost went full circle. Um, but this study here on a human or humans uh, with everolimus showed, again, higher total cholesterol and some other markers, which completely returned to baseline once the treatment course was over. Um, one, one other thing I want to say before I cut the edit here, um, how did it affect these patients with rheumatoid arthritis? Was there a benefit? Well, that six milligrams per day of everolimus uh, orally for 12 weeks was associated with a significant improvement in rheumatoid arthritis patient activity compared to control. Um, it also showed, or another study showing just a half milligram every other day for 24 weeks with conventional treatment showed a significant um or significantly more benefit than just conventional treatment alone. So if someone's already getting treated, uh, if you put um, the rapamycin on just a half milligram every other day, they had even more benefit there. So just to conclude that systematic review, some of the takeaways that we had, um, this is one of the big things too. They didn't report actually any serious adverse events related to rapamycin or its derivatives in any studies in the systematic review. Um, though responsibly, the review does mention six of the studies were just a single dose and therefore does not give enough information really to see the potential long-term uh, side effect profile. Um, Everolimus has had some fatalities uh, related to it in some trials, and that is something that should definitely be considered. Uh, again, context is going to come into play there, but I did want to note that, okay? Um, but for the sake of this video, no uh, adverse events were even found in the systematic uh, review with rapamycin or its analogs related to anti-aging. So the dosing profiles I gave you, um, I think the highest was like up to six milligrams, some were just a half milligram. Uh, there is also something very unique uh, that I had found, which is pretty cool. It was a study, uh, and it was, a, it was an online survey, so there's going to be some confounding uh, pieces in that because uh, it was self-reported, so there's going to be some bias here. But it was 333 adults with a history of off-label rapamycin use and 172 adults who had never used rapamycin. Um, 95% participants report, of participants reported that they were using rapamycin for that anti-aging or a longevity, health longevity um, reason. Uh, the most common dosing was six milligrams once a week, and other otherwise it was six milligrams once every 14 days, respectively. So just once a week rapamycin, or every two weeks. Uh, rapamycin has a longer half-life, so I think that's why they chose rapamycin, as well as, like I said earlier about Everolimus having some issues in one of their trials, right? I think it might have been deemed that rapamycin might be safer for this type of um, anti-aging piece. So no serious adverse events were reported in that study, although um, <clears throat> oral ulcers, right? So it depends on how you see that. That's not technically considered a serious adverse event, but oral ulcers um, had been popping up in, in this self-reported study. Um, but all of this is more or less great information that, you know, that, that there are studies, there's information coming out about rapamycin use in humans for anti-aging, seeing what the side effect profile looks like, um, seeing the different health benefits um, from healthier looking skin, uh, helping uh, people with arthritis, um, helping from a cardiovascular standpoint, reducing cardio workload, increased oxygen consumption. These are all great markers, right? Outside of just what it's doing with mTOR and the cell cycle and, and making sure that uh, we don't have an overabundance of hyperfunctioning cell morphologies due to dysfunctioning mTOR within the cell cycle. Currently, rapamycin is actually being prescribed for anti-aging. There is a, a clinic out uh, in New York that is currently doing it, um, and they've been doing it for years. So if any prescribers are watching and you've been on the fence as to whether or not you wanted to prescribe a, um, rapamycin, uh, as far as I know, their, their clinic is, is doing great. Um, so, you know, <laughs> one thing to consider. I'm not going to say the name. I don't want to endorse them. Um, we're not paid to endorse them or anything like that. So we'll just keep it vague, but just know that there's clinics out there doing that. Um, we get so bent out of shape about side effects. Um, when sometimes things should be dosed towards therapy related goals, uh, a good instance of this happening currently is an over the counter medication aspirin. I know I touched on that a little earlier, uh, but aspirin for rheumatoid arthritis, I think is up to like 
3,600 milligrams a day, right around there, um, for the therapeutic goal of helping with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, therapeutic goals of like heart health and general cardiovascular health would be 81 milligrams. So that had nothing to do with the side effect profile. That had everything to do with therapeutic goals. So that's one way to look at this too. Um, rapamycin also, it's a good idea for rapamycin and uh, its analogs or like everolimus, for instance, that you do get serum levels tested. So oral dosing isn't going to behave the same way in your serum uh, from one individual to the next. So that is a good way to monitor how much uh, rapamycin you have in your system. And I say this, you know, to be cautious for everyone, but, and now this wasn't in humans, this was in mice, but there is another study out there that shows... Um, dose-related correlation with anti-aging, and the higher the dose they gave to mice, the, the longer the lifespan of the mice. So, But that didn't say, you know, to what degree there was a side effect profile of the mouse, um, but they lived the longest. Um, what I'm getting at there is we still need a lot more information to come out, uh, but serum level testing could be a good thing to do. Uh, we do have some parameters on how you'd want to do serum level testing and what ranges. Um, we have a, a bunch of different oral dosing and different um, time frames that people have done it on with different disease states and the different benefits it's helpful for. We have clinics already out there that are doing this. We have clinics around us that are willing to prescribe it. For instance, smokers, people who smoke cigarettes, lose on average uh, about six to 10 years of their lifespan Okay, so then we tell everybody who's a smoker to quit smoking because that's going to extend their, their lifespan statistically six to ten years. If rapamycin has been proven to extend your lifespan, would we not just say it's healthier to be on rapamycin than to not? I mean, that's a little tongue twist or a little kind of play on words, but it's a unique way to think about rapamycin. I appreciate your time. There might be a third video, depending on some comments on YouTube or questions. I definitely want to go into more detail with some few nuances with rapamycin, but I hope you appreciated this video.